Good morning, everybody. Man, it's so great to be with you. December is here. What a great month. I love Christmas time. We get to celebrate a lot of things, but uh, most importantly, we get to celebrate uh, the birth of our Savior on that beautiful, glorious day. And uh, man, I, there's so much to be thankful for, even uh, in, in a world full of uh, craziness and uncertainty right now. And I, and I hope you have things in your life that you're grateful for and thankful for. Uh, but uh, I'm grateful and thankful that we get to worship together today. Uh, so I want to invite you, get ready to, to worship with us, get ready to sing these words with us this morning. Sing from the mountains, from the mountains, we will shout it out for the Lord.
Amen.
all sing how great how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and oh we'll sing how great how great is our God in the name of both Time, lift it up, sing, how great is our God? Come on, tell him. How great is our God? Sing with me, how great is our God? And oh, we'll sing, how great, how great is our God? All we'll sing. God, as we move into this time of year, this time where we celebrate the birth of your son, Jesus, God, may we all be reminded of just how great he is and how great you are. God, you are the name above all names. God, I am so thankful that you find us worthy of praising your name. God, thank you for the, the gift of song, the gift of singing. God, may it always be pleasing to you. We love you so much and we thank you for this time that we've had together. We all said together in the name of Jesus, amen. Hey, boys and girls, the countdown to Christmas is on. Happy December. I hope as we move into the Christmas season, you continue to remember what we talked about all of November about having a heart of thankfulness and a heart of gratitude, no matter what your circumstances may be. Last week, we talked about the communion and the importance of taking communion as a habit of gratitude and a gratitude towards Jesus and what he has done for us. This month, our new theme is no assembly required. 
And I love that. Boys and girls, your mom and dad will probably have a few things to assemble um, as close as Christmas gets. But when we stop and think about it, the only thing that we need to do this month is to stop and celebrate the birth of Jesus, the greatest gift that God has ever given us. We don't need to build it or make it or design it. We just get to sit and enjoy it. So please grab your Bibles and join with me in Kids Corner as we talk about promises and the importance of keeping promises. So I'll see you in just a little bit. Bye, boys and girls. Hey, everyone. Uh, as we're going to continue to worship, we have a couple announcements before we take our tithes and offerings this morning. Uh, we got some birthdays to announce. Uh, I want to say happy birthday to Daniel Smart. Um, if you guys can see him on Facebook, but he's one of our um, just treasured volunteers who comes in each and every week to help this actually happen. So if you're watching this video, you can thank Daniel for that. Uh, we also have Judy Montgomery, Linda Gonzalez, Sherry Landon, and Christian Luthke are all getting older. And so again, pray for them because anyone born in December knows how difficult it is to have a birthday in December and getting their gifts so close to Christmas. And so again, so pray for them. And then we also have two uh, celebrations of anniversaries for Paul and Laura Lee Ryan, uh, 61 years of marriage, and Dave and Mary Ogan with 62 years of marriage. That is awesome. We love hearing about that, and it gives us younger couples something to aspire to. And again, with that, so we also have a couple, three announcements for us, some activities that we have going on for you guys. Um, the first one is our we have our prime time on December 11th here at the church at noon. And so uh, for those, if you uh, uh, meet that category, been your prime time in your life, come in and have a wonderful lunch. And Pastor Pete uh, is going to have a wonderful devotion for you guys. And also the ladies. Um, they're having a luncheon on December 14th here at noon as well. So come in and enjoy for that. And this is one of our uh, outreach to our, our communities. On December 19th, we're going to have what we call now is a drive-by Adopt-the-Block Ministry Christmas uh, giveaway. And so one of these things we now are adopting with COVID is we are just uh, uh, these ministries and the family and the neighborhood we've been ministering for a number of years on December 19th as we're just going to be a blessing to the community. And uh, one of the ways in which we do that is with uh, um, just gifts and food actually as well. And so if you want to be a part of that, please reach out to uh, the office and we can get you in contact because we need over 80 uh, providing gifts for over 80 families. And so if you want to be a blessing to the community, um, please reach out so we can give you the uh, really a shopping list and let you know that you make a huge difference during this time and letting you know that this is a practical way that we can show how much we love our neighbor and how much our neighbors are loved by God. And so please um, um, pray about that and be a blessing to our community for that. And um, with that being said, we are going to take... Um, this morning's tithes and offerings, and we're just going to ask a blessing uh, for that. So would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, again, we recognize that, Lord, you are a generous God. And, Lord, in your word, it tells us to be uh, joyous, excited um, givers of the resources you've entrusted to us. And so, Lord, um, we know how excited we can be just uh, getting that perfect gift for our loved one. Lord, help us to have that kind of same excitement for this offering, knowing that, Lord, we are giving back to you. It's a reflection. We are inviting to be a part of your generosity and reflecting that characteristic here on earth. And so, Lord, we ask that you take these offerings and you multiply them to meet the needs, not only here in Corona, but also all throughout the globe. And so, Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. If you're joining us for the first time this Christmas season, we want to welcome you and let you know that we're talking through a folk tale called The Tale of Three Trees. It was recommended to us by um, the uh, superintendent of our preschool because it's a story that the kids love, but it also has significance for Christ, his birth, and death and resurrection. So we're in the second week of that, and we're going to uh, be, be going into a, a reading from the book so you can be up to speed with what the book actually says and then get into the message of the example that the book talks about. Now, last week, uh, John had his young son Isaac reading uh, to you, and not to be outdone, my young son, um, we still call him Timmy because that's appropriate. He is the youngest, uh, but Timmy is going to be reading for you today. So 
sit back and enjoy it. Now also, um, you're going to see three trees sitting on the stage. Those of you at home can't see what we have here in front of us. And those three trees each have significance. The white one goes with last week and talking about the star that was over Bethlehem and the birth of the child. This week, the blue one is front and center because of what we're going to be talking about this morning. And then next week will be the red one. So God bless you as you sit back and listen to Timmy Reed. Once upon a mountaintop, three little trees stood and dreamed of what they wanted to become when they grew up. The second little tree looked out at the small stream trickling by on its way to the ocean. I want to be a strong sailing ship, he said. I want to travel mighty waters and carry powerful kings. I will be the strongest ship in the world. Years passed, the rains came, the sun shone, and the little trees grew tall. One day, three woodcutters climbed the mountain. The second woodcutter looked at the second tree and said, this tree is strong, it is perfect for me. With a swoop of his shining ax, the second tree fell. Now I shall sail mighty waters, thought the second tree. I shall be a strong ship fit for kings. The second tree smiled when the woodcutter took him to a shipyard, but no mighty sailing ships were being made that day. Instead, the once strong tree was hammered and sawed into a simple fishing boat. Too small and too weak to sail an ocean or even a river, he was taken to a little lake. Every day, he brought in loads of dead fish, smelly fish. One evening, a tired traveler and his friends crowded into the old fishing boat. The traveler fell asleep as the second tree quietly sailed out into the lake. Soon, a thundering and thrashing storm arose. The little tree shuddered. He knew he did not have the strength to carry so many passengers safely through the wind and rain. The tired man awakened. He stood up, stretched out his hand, and said, Peace. The storm stopped as quickly as it had begun. The second, and suddenly the second tree knew he was carrying the king of heaven and earth. This part of the story of the tale of three trees um, tells a story that comes from the, uh, all three Gospels, uh, Matthew, Luke, and Mark. And we're going to be taking a look at Mark this morning as we get into it uh, so that you have an understanding of the references to Jesus and also so that we have an understanding in this season the references towards Jesus and what he can do in our lives. So let's pray and ask for God's blessing over this as we get ready to go into God's word. Father, we thank you and we know that you are the one who directs through your word power, enlightenment, and everything that we need. And we pray thanking you for sending your son. And during this season, we celebrate the sending of him. Father, we pray that as we get into this message this morning, as we get into the power of your word from the Gospel of Mark, that you will enlighten lives, that you will touch people who need to be touched. And I pray, Father, that they come into a relationship with you like they've never had before because they recognize you are the sole source of eternity. You are the sole source of peace here on earth and in eternity. So I pray this in the power of Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we have all, as the story says, we have all been in storms. Uh, in California, we don't get into too many of them, but we have all been in storms. And in some places in the U.S., they even call them gully washers because they flash flood and they fill a gully and they clean it all out. And if you're out in the desert or if you do some hiking like I do, you find that you can, um, if you're not smart, you can get caught in a flash flood very easily in certain parts of even California, especially out in the desert. But what people do who are around all of those environments is they get used to the signs. They know what to look for. They know um, when something is coming that is going to have some dire consequences, especially when it comes to weather. Uh, there's an old saying, and actually it comes from the Bible. Jesus actually relates it to the Pharisees because they know these sayings, but they don't know God's word. But here's the old saying. It says, red sky at night, sailor's delight. Red sky at morning, sailor's warning. When, when sailors are looking at what the weather is going to be like that day, they take cues from nature. They, they look at what's going on, and people who routinely have to go out to sea are uh, well aware of what those signs are. Now, I don't know if you've ever been on the ocean when it gets a little bit dicey out there or on a storm, but it can be sort of uh, entertaining. And the reason I say entertaining is when I was in my mid-20s, uh, my two brothers-in-law, uh, my wife's brothers, they were in school, medical school up in San Francisco. So we had this harebrained idea. We were going to go rent a sailboat one day. So we rented a sailboat, much like the picture you see. We knew nothing about sailing. And we figured we were all intelligent enough. We, we knew intellectually things about sailing, but we had never practiced it at all. 
We'd been on some Hobie cats and done some things, but we really didn't know anything about sailing. So we get to this guy on the dock, and we're trying to convince him, and we figure, okay, who has the best way of persuading this guy to let us rent his boat? And I, I know he probably looked at us afterwards. He was probably in his 50s or 60s, which was old to us then. Looked at us and said, ah, these kids, what's the worst that could happen? If they capsize it, I got insurance. Probably just let us have it because he knew we really didn't know what we were talking about. So we take it out, and the weather looks just like it does in this picture. It's one of those days where, oh, my gosh, this is gorgeous. Now, what you have to understand is our three wives are in the boat going, you guys do not know what you're doing. What are you getting us into? This is crazy. Why are we even going with you? They're looking at each other wondering what sanity test they took to even be in the boat with us. We get out, and we're sailing around Alcatraz. And those of you who have been to San Francisco and around the bay, you know where I'm talking about, out by Alcatraz and Angel Island. And all of a sudden, it gets dark, and it comes swooping down, and it starts to rain. And we're in this boat, and we're going, what do we do now? Now, we had figured out how to tack and get where we were, but now we had to worry about a storm and getting back. All we were worried about was, can we get the boat back to land, let alone find the berth that we came out of? And then while we're in the middle of the storm, the jib sail. Now, the jib sail is that sail, that, that one that's out in front. It went down into the water. It has a line that's supposed to hold it up. It wasn't holding it up. It went down into the water. So who gets elected? I'm the youngest one. Who gets elected to go out and get the jib sail? Me. So I'm the idiot. I'm the foolish one. My wife goes, no, Michael, don't go out there. You don't and I go out to the bow of the boat with my wife shrieking in the background, and I go out, and I have to reach down on the bow. Now, you have to know, the bow is not standing still. There's a storm going, so the bow is doing this, and I'm reaching down, trying to get the jib sail up so that we could try to get ourselves back into the berth that we came out of. We eventually get back, no harm, no foul. Boat was in fine shape. I don't think our wives will ever go near the ocean again with us, but it was a great experience, and we learned a lot. What it taught me was, though, When you go out in a boat and everything looks good, that isn't necessarily the way it's going to stay. In fact, in the story that we're going to read from Mark, as well as we're going to look at Luke and Matthew, in that story we find that a storm came up really fast. Now, to preface that, there's a story that you guys are all familiar. In in Gloucester, Massachusetts, stands this statue. And it stands there in honor to all the men who go out to sea. It says who go down to the sea. All of the men who have been out there in Gloucester, A unique thing happened in 1991. It looked just like this day here in the picture. There were um, clouds in the sky. It was October. It was just a few days before Halloween. And as far as everybody in Gloucester could see, it was just a normal day. So the Andrea Gale sets out, and it's going up towards Canada to do some fishing, swordfish fishing. They want to get their full hold full of swordfish and then come on back with it. So they go out, and they're going fishing. What they don't know is what's going on around them. And what's going on around them is a storm that is brewing. In fact, it is in retrospect now called the killer storm of 1991. And what was happening is three different things were converging. Three different things were were embracing this one small area and attacking it all at one time. From the southeast was a storm that was the remnants of a hurricane, Grace. (laughs) Funny name for a hurricane, right? Grace. And Grace was coming up and heading towards the New England coast. Coming from inland was what they were calling the blizzard of the century, was the blizzard of 1991 that was leaving ice and snow all through, and it was converging in the same spot. And then a high-pressure area was coming down from the north. These all converged to create what you have known in the movie as the perfect storm. That perfect storm showed itself on land, it showed itself on sea, and the Andrea Gale sailed off not knowing that was coming. Now, obviously soon into it. And by the way, this is a true story. The Andrea Gale was lost at sea, and all hands on deck were lost. They don't really know what happened. When you are watching the movie and it plays it out that they are running into this wave and attacking it, there were rogue waves out there that day. Whether or not it's exactly how they met their end, we don't know, because none of them survived. But we do know they got caught in the convergence of these three things, this perfect storm. And this is the picture that many people are familiar with because it shows the size of the boat and the size of the rogue wave. Now, if you were sitting in this building, this building has 12 to 15-foot ceilings. These waves, these rogue waves, can get 30 to 40 feet. That means that if you're sitting in this building, you look up, the wave is twice as tall as the ceiling you're looking at or taller. That is monstrous. That is huge coming down on this boat. Now, why do I say all this? Because a perfect storm is exactly what happened on the Sea of Galilee. Now, to look at it, you wouldn't think this is a sea you have to worry about. In fact, it's not even a sea. It's a lake. It is a big body of water, about 13 miles by 8 miles, and it is placid most of the time. 
but it is notorious for having storms pop up out of the blue. On the, on the one side of it are the Golan Heights, and on the other side is the flatland of Tiberias and Capernaum and all that area over there. But a storm, because of the, the heights, can swoop down and be stirred up almost instantaneously. Now, that's important to know because the story that we're going to read from the book of Mark plays well into understanding the terrain and what they were dealing with. Here's the story as it's related to Mark, and I'm going to read through this. You can read along with me. On that day, this comes from Mark chapter 4, from 35 to 41. On that day, when the evening came, he said to them, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him along and with them in the boat, just as he was, and, the other, bo and other boats went with them. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat, so much that the boat was already filling up. Scary time. You're in a boat. It's not supposed to have water inside. It's supposed to have water outside. And it was filling the boat. Jesus himself was in the stern. They even tell us where he was. He was down below in the stern, asleep, on a cushion. And they woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Okay, now, the people who are saying this are seasoned fishermen. I'll get to that in a minute. And he got up, and he rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? They became very much afraid and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, I want to track us through this, and I want us to take apart pieces of it, but we have to start with what are some of the premises that we can understand from the very beginning. First off, when they got in the boat, it was good weather. It was good weather. They wouldn't have gotten in the boat in the middle of a storm. They got in the boat. No one objected to getting into the boat to go to the other side, and that's significant. Jesus said, let's go to the other side. Jesus didn't say, let's go into the middle of the lake where there's a storm, and let's see if we can sink this thing. No. He said, let's go to the other side. They, he had on board with him experienced fishermen. You know that James and John and Peter and Andrew were part of fishing families? They owned these boats. They would go out into the lake, into the Sea of Galilee, and fish on a regular basis. They knew where to pull into port. They knew where to fish. They knew what it looked like in the sky before a storm was coming. They said nothing about going out. No one raised objections when, they went, when he said, go to the other side. And there were a lot of boats out there with them. All of them went out. So you have to understand, no one was sitting there going, it looks like a storm. There wasn't this red sky at morning, sailor's warning going around. It was one of those days where you look and you go, this is a great day for sailing. This is cool. So they set, they set off, and they're going to go to the other side. Now, I want to go through this piece by piece, and you can see in the yellow in the, on the screen, these are the pieces I want to pick at. First off, Jesus said, let's go to the other side. Do we listen to Jesus and believe what he says, or do we just sort of half listen to what he says? When he says, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age, do we go, well, I know he said that, but Jesus said, let's go to the other side. When he confronts them and says, are you afraid? Why are you afraid? One of the things they forgot is he said, we're going to the other side. I don't care what happens in the middle. We're going to the other side. They didn't pay attention to that. And leaving the crowd, he took along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats with them. Other people were out there sailing at the same time. Now, I, I want you to pay attention to the way the other Gospels express what was going on. The storm came up. Mark, and the one we just read from, it says, And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. So by the time they go to Jesus, the boat is already filling up with water. Matthew says it this way. He says, There arose a great storm on the sea. That sounds the same. So that the boat was being covered with waves. Okay, these were not little bitty waves. Those rogue waves happen on the Sea of Galilee also. They get huge because of the way the winds stir up. And waves were crashing and covering the boat. Not a comfort zone for most people. And then Luke says that I think the best of all. It says, and a fierce gale of wind descended on the lake, and they began to be swamped and to be in danger. Okay, now these are experienced fishermen who know when it is to be afraid, when it's right to be afraid, and when it's not necessary to be afraid by what's going on with the weather. They were afraid. In fact, when they wake Jesus up, they even, they even tell him, are you not even concerned about us that we're perishing? They're really fearful. And these are water people. Now, there's people out there that are not water people. I know that some of you uh, do not even like to go underwater. Uh, you take a shower and you dodge the drops. It, it's one of those things where water is not your thing. And you have a phobia of water. I get that. I get that. That was not these guys. 
These guys were not afraid of water. They sat out on the lake on a regular basis. They would dive in when they got all hot and sweaty from, from fishing. Water was their life. They were used to being around it. But at this moment, at this moment, it scared them. So let's keep reading. It says, Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Okay, Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. How boring had the ride have to have been, or how tired would Jesus have to have been to be asleep? And how safe would he have thought it to be for him to be asleep? He's going to crawl down, and he's going to settle in. And you know, boats have a rocking motion. For some of you, that means seasick. But for some of us, it means sleep. Some of you, you get in the car, and the instant it starts moving, you're, you're dozing in the, in the passenger seat. But others, the, the motion gets them. It makes them sick at their stomach or whatever. Jesus was very calm. He's on the water. He had been teaching. He gets into the boat, and he goes to sleep. And it says in Matthew, but Jesus himself was asleep. And then I like this last one. This one says it the best. But as they were sailing along, he fell asleep. Jesus was not worried about anything. There wasn't a worry at all for him. He fell asleep because he was relaxed. He was comfortable, and he was tired, which is what you do. Now, the rest of them were up on the boat, looking at what was going on, doing their thing with the sailing, going from one side of the lake to the other side. And, and let me just mention, when he said go to the other side, you need to know he's going from a territory that is um, welcoming and very much a, a favored area of the Sea of Galilee. And he's going over to the east side of it, which is an area that is um, bordered by what they call Decapolis. It was this, the ten city area. And it was, um, it was worldly as far as the Jews were concerned. Now, some people believe because when he goes over there, he heals a demoniac that's in a graveyard that they were already encountering by the waves and the storm that came up, a demonic force preventing them from going over there to take care of this demoniac and to release him from the demons. Whether that's true or not, Scripture doesn't tell us. But it could be that way. And this storm came up so fast, it could have been Satan deciding he wanted to do whatever he could to thwart and see how Jesus and his followers were going to handle it. Suffice it to say that they get on the lake, Jesus is comfortably asleep, and they're getting fearful. Okay, and it says, and he got up, and he rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, hush, be still. And the wind became, and, and the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm. I don't know what words it is that would cause you to freeze in your tracks. Um, as parents, when our kids are little and we know that they have the uh, tendency to run out someplace without thinking, the ball goes in the street, they run the street, we like to believe that with just a couple of words we could stop that action and get them to not go into any place of danger. You would like to believe that when you say your kid's name, Timothy, he's going to stop. Or he's going to at least caution himself, turn around and look at you. You'd like to believe that what, no, stop that your voice would carry that. Okay, well, we're not the God of the universe, but Jesus is. And so what does he say? He stands up and he rebukes. Now, that word rebuke doesn't mean that he just calmly said. It says he gets in the face. The word rebuke is he gets in the face of the wind. He rebuked the wind and he said to it, hush, be still. And the wind died down and became perfectly calm. Have you ever tried to carry a cup of coffee or a cup of water or anything, any distance that's very full? It is less than calm when you're walking, right? It, it's, it teeters towards the edge. And if you like to get a full cup of coffee because you don't want to have to go and get more later, you, you fill it up and you're walking, you're trying to go upstairs. And the more you concentrate on keeping it still, the more it vibrates and the more it ends up getting close to spilling. Well, you try to steady that and it's difficult to steady it. And the more you think about it, the harder it gets. Well, here's what Jesus did. This is a sea that has a raging torrential rain with winds that, winds that are gale force coming out. And what does Jesus say? He says, hush, hush. What does the wind do? It doesn't just die down. It says that it died down. But the words after that tell us it did much more than that. It didn't just die down. It became calm. That picture I showed just a little bit ago of the Sea of Galilee, the placid look of the Sea of Galilee, most of the times I've been in Israel, that's the way it looks. One time, it rained when we were out there. I got a little bit of a taste of the up and down that goes with the Sea of Galilee. But for the most part, it's calm and placid. What Jesus did was instantaneously take it from a raucous environment to calm, which is what he is powerfully capable of doing. 
And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in just a couple of minutes. In Matthew, it says he rebuked the winds. Again, that word rebuke is used every single time. Rebuke the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. He rebuked the wind in Luke. And the surging waves, okay, this is, catch this. The waves are surging, and they became calm. That's a dramatic stop. And I don't know about you, but if, if you throw a pebble in the water and you watch it splash, you're skipping stones, and you see those ripples, they go on, they go on, they go on, they go on, they go on. And it takes a long time before them, for, for them to stop or slow down. Jesus says, hush, and it's calm. It instantly dies down. That's power. That's amazing power. So much amazing power that the disciples had a comment for it afterwards. But let's move on. It says, And when the wind had died down, it became perfectly calm. And then he said, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Now you have to know, they've been with Jesus just before getting in the boat, and he was healing people. He was doing all sorts of things. Do you have no faith after seeing this? In fact, some people believe that getting into the boat and having the disciples in the boat at this time was a test of their faith to see whether or not they were going to be able to use the authority that Jesus said they had. You'll remember, Jesus sends out 70. And when he sends them out, he says, you have the authority over serpents, demons, scorpions, all sorts of things. Go out and do this. And they go out and they heal and they come back. They're all excited. We were able to do this. We were able to do this. And Jesus looking at them going, I know. I told you, you have authority over all those things. Well, these are the same disciples that are sitting there and they're fearful of the wind. Even though he has commented, I have authority. I have given you authority. Maybe it was a test for them because he says to them, do you still have no faith? They became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this? Now, why would they say that? Can you imagine Jesus sitting there? I'm Jesus. You you know who I am. I'm I'm Jesus. You've been with me. Why do they say, who then is this man that even the wind and the sea obey him? They didn't know that was part of what went along with him. They didn't understand that was him. Why? Why? Because their Messiah was someone who was going to come and conquer and take the Romans out, and they were going to set up a kingdom that was all going to be of Jews, and it was going to be the way God intended it to be from the beginning, right? No, that's not the way God intended it. That's what they thought, though. So this Jesus that now has over nature the ability to issue just two or three words and have it all calm amazes them because that wasn't the Messiah, nor was it the full package of the Messiah they thought was coming. I find that fascinating because they're going with Jesus every step of the way and they don't even realize who they're with. They don't even realize what he's capable of. Okay, here's what we can take from this. Perfect storms come from all directions. As I mentioned with the Perfect Storm movie, what happened in 1991, there was a storm coming from the east, one coming from the north, one coming from the west. They all converge. In your life, perfect storms will not come in a calculated way. (laughs) There's no forecaster for it. There's no weatherman you can dial up and say, is there a perfect storm headed my way? No, it doesn't happen that way. You are going to run into things that are going to hit you from left field, hit you from right field, and hit you from behind, and you won't even know they're coming. What do you do when that happens? It happens in all of our lives. You say to yourself, I don't know how it could get any worse, and then the other shoe drops. (laughs) And just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, the thing that could get worse did. And you wonder, what am I going to do now, or what are we going to do now? The other thing that comes from this is your skills or our skills are not enough to defeat this. These are professional fishermen. They're out there and they don't know what to do next to the extent that they wake up a sleeping savior and say, don't you care about us? Aren't you going to do something about this? How can you be sleeping through this? That would be me. I I wouldn't be saying, what are you going to do to help us, Jesus? I'd be going, how are you asleep? What, what, What is going on here? Did you take A lot of Benadryl before you went to bed. What's what's going on here, Jesus? How can you sleep during this? It's rocking the waves. There's water coming in. And Jesus is just snoring. I don't know he snores, but Jesus is just taking it easy. He's chilling until they wake him up. Fear is a natural next step when we get bombarded with all those things. It is. For us to be afraid of what's hitting us because we didn't plan on it is natural. It's human. Why should we not be afraid because we don't know what's coming next? That was where the disciples were. Okay, it's storming, the waves are crashing over, there are rogue waves that are larger than we've seen before, and they're wondering, what are we going to do about this? It's not just that they don't have the ability to do anything, they're saying, what do we do? Well, the one thing we don't do, especially as followers of Jesus, is we don't give up. We don't say, "Um, I've reached the end of my rope, I'm done, it's over. 
Because then we're ignoring who's sleeping down in the hold of the boat. Because he's there. He's there waiting for you to wake him up and have him interact with your life. The Jesus we worship is greater than our picture of him. As I was growing up in, in Sunday school, we had those pictures that, that showed Jesus with a very soft face and long flowing hair and a long white robe. And, and then about the 70s, there was a guy by the name of Hooks who came out with a drawing that made Jesus look rugged. I like that. It started to get a little bit more like I would picture Jesus being because the other one was just way too soft for me to have much faith in as being able to deliver me from troubled times. The Jesus that you have in your head, the Jesus you have in your heart, do you have a true picture of him? Because quite obviously, the guys on the boat didn't. They didn't know who they were dealing with. If they did, they would have been clicking back, having another cup of coffee, and going, oh, the storm, not a problem, we got Jesus. But that wasn't the way they did it, nor is it the way we do it when trouble hits us. What we do is we hit the panic button, we try all the things until we exhaust our resources, and then we think about turning to Jesus. <laughs> and all the time he's sitting there going, um, I'm, I'm right here, um, all you need to do is call on me. I'm available for you. Just let me know you're ready for me to step in, and I will. That's the Jesus picture we should all have, but we don't have that picture. Instead, what we do is we get in the panic mode, and we forget he's even there. Here is where we forget the most. The physical battles, maybe we'll call on Jesus more. We get sick. We want Jesus to heal us. We'll pray for healing. We'll pray for God's hand to heal. And that's great. That's, but the, the spiritual battles is where we, quite often, forget that Jesus is willing to step in and ready to step in. I don't know what you're facing during this holiday time. I don't know if you're facing times that are fiscally, meaning financially, troublesome for you. I don't know if you are physically dealing with things and you don't know what's coming next. But here's a battleground that you may not even be thinking about, but you may be in the middle of a battle with, and that is the spiritual realm. Because what's going to happen, <laughs> what's going to happen right now is much like what's happened in this election. In the election, there was a lot of diversion going on. Let's take a look at this. Let's take a look. Let's take a look at this. I don't know that they'll ever get to a truth. But the reality is there were a lot of distractions out there to get people off of focusing on what was the most important. In the same way in our life, Satan wants to do that. He wants to take our attentions away from Jesus and put it on all the little travesties that he can dig up to aggravate us. That is a spiritual battle. That's not a physical battle. That is Satan at work seeking to distract us from what's important. And are we going to let him? Are we going to be the ones who give in to that spiritual battle and listen to what Satan is saying instead of listening to what God's word says? Now, you, you'll be saying, what does this have to do with um, Christmas? What does this have to do with anything related to the holidays? Well, I'll tell you. The Sea of Galilee is a very placid place. It is a very calm place. And that is the place that de Jesus desires for us to be living during all times. That doesn't mean it's going to be an easy road, but in our hearts, he wants our hearts to be at peace just like the picture of the Sea of Galilee is. He wants us to be at rest. He wants us to be comfortable. And when I say that, that's not prosperity that I'm talking about. That's talking about no matter what goes on around me, if I'm in jail, if I'm in this, if I'm in that, if I'm being persecuted, he wants us to be at peace because he brings peace. The reality of it is, many of us are going to find ourselves in the next couple of weeks as we get close to the holiday in a perfect storm. We're going to find ourselves looking at a huge rogue wave headed towards us, and we're not going to know what to do with it. We have one of two choices. Either we follow suit with these disciples who are in the boat, we panic, and we think at the last minute to wake up Jesus before this whole thing is scuttled and ask if he can do something, or we head into everything with Jesus right by our side. Is Jesus in your boat? That's a question you have to answer. Is he the one who is residing in your boat? Are you not going anywhere out on the lake except having Jesus with you? If you are, you're ill-equipped and you're unmanned. You will not get to the other side. The only way you get to the other side is with Jesus in your boat. So you have to answer the question, is he there? In Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah, 600 years before Jesus was born, tells the magnitude of the Christ child that's going to be born. And he uses these words. You're familiar with these words. These are not going to be strange words to you. He says, for a child will be born to us, and a son will be given to us. And the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called, now catch these words, Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, eternal Father, catch this one, Prince of 
peace. And there will be no end to the increase of his government or of his what? What? Peace. No end to the increase of his peace. You don't have to go through anything during this holiday time alone. Jesus is right there if you'll let him be. And if you're walking and talking with him on a regular basis, you don't have to wake him up. He's already awake and attentive to what's going on in your life. In fact, I can promise you, he's been there ahead of you. And he's just waiting for you to utilize him instead of trying to do it on your own. Let's pray. Father, I pray that we will rely on you during this holiday time. This tree that grew up, that turned into a boat, that carried the Savior, who was the king of all eternity and the earth, and quite a, this king, this king desires to reside in our lives, Father. We know that. We hear that. There is no way we can come to you except through him. I pray that everyone who hears this message is able to recognize that no matter what they're going through, there is a solution, and it isn't within themselves. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. So I pray, Father, that you will touch their heart by the power of your spirit, not by my words, but by your word. You will touch their hearts and cause them to recognize it's today that they make a change. Today they're not going to try and cross that lake without Jesus in their boat. And I pray this in the power of Jesus' name. Amen. Here we are again to be able to celebrate a communion, a time with Christ for what he's done for us. My spirit just feels the warmth of being here as we uh, look forward to participating in this, visualizing as you close your eyes and take the bread that he hands out to you. As he's saying, as he has, lifts up the bread and gives thanks, he says to us, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat this in remembrance of me. Oh, he didn't take it. And as they finished, he picked up the cup he said, the cup is the new covenant of my blood that was shed for thee. Take and drink. As you go through this, we just remember the sacrifice that he provided for us. What a blessing it is that we can do this in remembrance of him.
sing spirit. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. When you walk upon the waters, wherever you would call me, take me deeper than my faith could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. I will call. What a beautiful song to end the service. How great that thing that we can celebrate and our spirit just reunites with God for this. Father God, we're just thankful that uh, we have this time to enjoy together, to be able to hear the word that you provide for us. As we go through this, remember, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe so that the power of the Holy Spirit may dwell within you and abide with you always. Amen.